We've talked about overall airline profitability. Now let's talk about specific route profitability. When companies refer to their profit and loss statement, they're generally referring to their income statement. When airlines talk about their P&L internally, they're generally referring to their route P&L. And unlike the income statement, which is prepared for their investors and is a public document, the route P&L is a confidential document and is, and is only shared internally. So let me show you an example of a very simple P&L. So I've created what a simple P&L might look like for XYZ Airlines for the past 12 months. And what an airline will do is they'll list all of their routes. And in this case, a route is a nonstop service. So this airline flies nonstop from Chicago to LaGuardia, from Chicago to Atlanta, etc. And then on the right-hand side, they'll calculate the margin. And then they'll generally sort the P&L for a most to least profitable route. And then they can evaluate the performance of each route relative to the overall performance. Now, I'm not going to say too much about how we calculate this margin. I just made these numbers up. I'll just uh, say a couple of things about revenue and cost. So what the airline needs to do is they need to figure out how much revenue each route generated. That can be fairly straightforward. So if people are flying from Chicago to LaGuardia nonstop, then the fares that they paid, the ancillary revenue, the baggage fees uh, are assigned to that route. If there's people flying from Los Angeles to LaGuardia, then that revenue from that itinerary needs to be prorated across the routes in that itinerary. And there's different ways of doing proration. So that's fairly straightforward. The costs, on the other hand, can get complex and even a bit controversial. And figuring out how to allocate all of the fixed and variable costs of the airline to each of these routes uh, can get fairly complicated. And, and we're not going to talk too much about it, but just note that this is um, this can be difficult and, of course, has a, a huge impact on the profitability of each route. So there's often a lot of debate in airlines about how to allocate these costs, and not every airline uh, does it the same. When airline managers evaluate the P&L, they're generally going to focus on two sections. And as you can imagine, they're going to go right to the top, and they're going to look for the routes that are generating the highest margins. Then they're going to go to the bottom, and they're going to take a look at the losers. Well, let's take a look at this top section first. This is certainly what the airline wants to see. They want to see their airlines in the green, generating positive margins. One thing they will consider, though, is are there routes that are generating margins that are too high, and are they doing so consistently? So let's change this to 40%. 40%. Now, I said that the route P&L is a confidential document. It's not shared outside the airline. But most airlines spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out how competitive, the, excuse me, how profitable their competitors are because they're looking for opportunities themselves. And if this market, if Chicago uh, LaGuardia is generating consistently high margins, then XYZ might be concerned that the margin is too high and they're asking for competition. So one thing they might do is add capacity themselves before their competitor does, and that brings down the margin. So, you know, the reason the margin is high is probably because the fares are high. And the way to bring down the fares is um, by adding capacity. So you'll sometimes hear revenue management people or, or uh, airline planning people saying, the fare is too high in this market, we have to bring the fare down. Well, you would think, well, you just go to the pricing department and they're going to lower the fare. Well, in reality, the way you lower average fares is by adding capacity. So that's a good problem to have. Certainly the hardest thing an airline has to do isn't to figure out how to bring down margins, but what to do about these losers down here. So let's talk about this section now. So the first thing to consider is that every airline's P&L will have some routes in the green and some routes in the red. And that's the way it ought to be. If an airline had every route generating a positive margin, it probably means they're not investing enough, they're not growing. When airlines add new markets, 
they don't expect them to be profitable right away. They take anywhere from six months to two years to turn profitable, depending on whether it's a leisure market or a business market, etc. And what they'll do is they'll generate a curve and they'll evaluate the performance of a new market relative to that ramp up curve rather to uh, rather than whether it's profitable or not at a pre, uh, a certain uh, point in time so let's say you know xyz decided to add a nonstop from knoxville to lahui hawaii uh somehow they thought there was a lot of pent up demand there and you know this market was just added uh, last month and it's generating a negative margin but that's you know perhaps that's actually better than they thought it would be at this time then there are certain markets you know maybe uh, L LAX Altoona somebody thought that was going to be a great market they've had it for 16 months and that one's on the chopping block it's not uh, it's not going to make it then Chicago Memphis this could be a perennial loser and it could be because of a need for relevance. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So let's say our airline XYZ has decided that they're going to establish a hub in Chicago. They're going to go up against United Airlines and they fly to a bunch of places but we said they uh, they fly to LaGuardia profitably, so profitably they may actually add capacity. They fly to Atlanta profitably, but they fly to Memphis unprofitably, and it's been unprofitable for a period of time. Well, it's quite possible that XYZ will continue to fly to Memphis at a loss indefinitely. And the reason is market relevance. So you know let's say that the XYZ sales team goes into a big company in Chicago and says we're going to give you some good fares please fly us instead of United Airlines well that company is going to want XYZ to service the, st the destinations that they need to go and each one of those destinations may not be profitable XYZ can't just cut out all of the unprofitable uh, destinations if they want to re remain relevant to the market. I think it's like a grocery store. Uh, I would imagine that not every product in a grocery store generates a positive margin, but there are certain things that a grocery store just has to have. For example, I, I don't know if milk is profitable, but you, know, you can imagine that even if a grocery store lost money on every gallon of milk it sold it's still going to sell milk because they have to sell milk if they're going to be relevant to their uh, customers now this rationale for continuing to serve unprofitable markets depends on the airlines business model I think most network carriers would view their hub structure in this manner, but there are exceptions. Spirit Airlines says they're not going to fly places where they don't make money, which seems to make a lot of sense, uh, but ironically, most airlines don't view their network that way. But Spirit has a different model and a different appeal. They don't go to companies and try to win all of their business with corporate discounts. Their customers are generally leisure customers, and they choose their airline based on the lowest price in the market. So Spirit's, uh, Spirit's uh, offering to the market is not based on relevance. It's based on their ability to offer the lowest fare. And this model is working quite well for Spirit. They do enter markets and lose money while they're waiting for them to mature. But if they don't reach certain goals, they leave that market. So an airline like Spirit might view these losers on their P&L in a different context from a network carrier. And also, different carriers have different levels of tolerance for leaving these perennial losers on their p &L. For example, let's say Los Angeles Altoona. Let's say XYZ added that market with great promise, and as soon as they added it, another carrier came in and started serving that market. Well, XYZ might be reluctant to retreat from that market and establish a reputation that they won't stand and fight for their market share. Well, this can be a very expensive strategy because it will be a test of who's going to blink first. And in the meantime, both carriers will lose money. 
Another thing that airlines will consider when evaluating this portion of the P&L is the opportunity cost. So take Knoxville Lahui. Let's say they've been serving this market for three months and their forecast was that it was going to take at least a year for the market to mature and turn profitable. Well, as long as they're investing in this market, that's an asset, an airplane that they don't have to deploy to another new market. And all airlines have a list of places where they would fly if they had additional airplanes. So it becomes an exercise in allocating scarce resources. There's a certain amount of assets the airline has that they want to use most efficiently and they need to determine how long they're going to wait for an investment to turn positive before redeploying that asset to you know potentially a better investment. So that's an airline's P&L. They don't take for granted that the winners will continue to be winners and they're constantly evaluating the losers on this section of the P&L to determine if that's the best place to uh, deploy their assets. Thanks for watching.